Hi everyone, my name is Njenga Hakina. I am the Africa Climate Editor at the China Global South Project. Just before we get to today's podcast, I want to update you on the work we are doing at CGSP. While there is extensive news coverage on China's relations with the United States, Europe and the current situation involving Taiwan, the same cannot be said for its interactions with developing countries, also referred to as the Global South. Unfortunately, there is a lack of comprehensive reporting in this area. And this is precisely where our team comes in. We have a dedicated group of editors who are in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and who diligently report on these stories in real time, every day. Furthermore, we make it a point to provide our content in three languages. We have it in English, in French, and in Arabic. If you'd like to join our growing community of readers from around the world, go to China Global South forward slash subscribe. And subscriptions start at just $19 a month. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Thank you. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China-Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. There's been quite a bit of news lately from the U.S. in the African development finance space, which is not something we've seen very much over the years. Let me just bring you up to date on what's been going on. The U.S. Export-Import Bank approved $900 million in financing for the Angolan government to build a pair of solar power plants that will generate 500 megawatts of electricity when that is operational. Also in Angola, the U.S. government is doing due diligence for a potential financing package of $250 million for an upgrade of the Lobito Atlantic Railway Corridor. Now, those of you who have been listening to the show with us and following our newsletter, we've been focusing a lot of attention on that Lubito corridor because it's an important logistics supply chain as an alternative to the port of Durban, where a lot of the copper and cobalt that is mined in the southern DRC and in Zambia is going. And now they're looking to send that via the Lubito corridor to the port of Lubito. So something very interesting to watch there. And then the U.S. Development Finance Corporation is using some of the $300 million that it allocated to build data centers in Africa to build a new facility in Ghana. Kobus, there are a couple of interesting things about these latest announcements from the U.S. I think that the fact that they're happening at all is remarkable because until now, the U.S. really hasn't done a lot in the infrastructure development space in Africa. Most U.S. development money in Africa has tended to go to support humanitarian and health issues. So this focus on infrastructure, specifically hard infrastructure, is something that is relatively new. It's also interesting to see what the U.S. is doing in the green energy space, technology, and transportation connectivity. Those seem to be the same priorities as to what the Chinese are also funding now in Africa. So if you happen to be in those sectors, you're doing pretty well because the money is still flowing. But what's also notable here is that the U.S. is ramping up its spending on African infrastructure development, just as the Chinese have been pulling back. We've seen those charts that show African development finance, not just in Africa, but around the world, that have basically been a giant ski slope downwards. But to be fair, the Chinese are not out of the game altogether. If you remember our conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago with Beijing-based project finance attorney Edwin Lee, he told us about the new Chinese developments priorities that are either small or beautiful. Now, those are those projects around $50 million, and there's a lot of those that are still taking place in Africa and other places in the global south. But in this new environment, the U.S. is now starting to actually stand out for the first time when it comes to infrastructure development finance, and that is something that we really haven't seen before. Yeah, this is a very interesting development. And as you mentioned, both them and the Chinese are focusing on green energy, on technology and transportation connectivity. And my 
guess is that focus is partly due to the you know kind of input from African policymakers, and that those are those are areas that African policymakers are also interested in in, in focusing on, and that they were they were working with the, with the Chinese on those issues before, because of course those are those are very strong areas for for different Chinese companies, and now you know there's more competition in those fields coming from the U.S., which is great news for Africa. You know, kind of that's like having more players in that field and having them up against each other is in general, I think, very good news. Well, let's dive into the current state of U.S.-Africa relations and, of course, how China fits into all of it. Later this summer will mark the first anniversary of the release of Washington's updated strategy for Africa. I think it came out last August when Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Pretoria. That was back when I was with you also in Pretoria back then, uh, Cobus, and I remember us talking about it. But just to refresh your memory, the Biden administration took a hard pivot in its Africa strategy by downplaying the role of China. In fact, I don't even think that they mentioned the word China at all in the new strategy, whereas the Trump administration, if you recall, really in their Prosper Africa strategy, talked only about confronting China. If you remember that uh, famous speech by John Bolton, the former national security advisor, he mentioned China 14 times when he was unveiling the Prosper Africa strategy. So a sharp contrast between the way the Biden administration is going about this and the way that the Trump administration did. So we thought it would be fun to check in with one of the architects of that new strategy to join us and give us an update on how things are going. Judd Devermont is the Senior Director for African Affairs on the National Security Council in the White House. Now, some of you may recall that Judd has been on the show a couple of times before, back when he was not in government, but this is the first time he's joining us as a senior official in the White House. Judd, a very good morning to you. Great to have you back on the show again. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Kobus. I'm really excited to, to join you. And uh, just to maybe put a fine point on it, throughout my career, whether I was the National Intelligence Officer for Africa or ran the CSIS Africa program and now in this job, I think the two of you, this podcast, your newsletter, it's been a mainstay in my career. I continue to benefit from your analysis and insight. So it's great to be back on the show. Well, if you're trying to bribe us with flattery to get a soft interview, it's not going to work. So I just want to give you a heads up right there, but we do appreciate the kind feedback. I'm ready for it. Okay. So listen, as I mentioned, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary. This was the document and a strategy that you worked very hard on with the team at the National Security Council. And at the NSC, you coordinated with a variety of agencies and different stakeholders in the U.S. government to come up with this strategy. It is a very different strategy than what we saw out of the Trump administration, and to some extent, even out of the Obama administration that also focused a lot on China. You've had a very busy past year now with the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, as well as a number of high-profile visits to the continent. Why don't you, we start our conversation, just kind of give us an update where we are one year into the strategy, how you think it's going, and give us a little bit of the insights in terms of, is it living up to what you hoped it would? Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. I do agree that the strategy was a hard pivot, but maybe not the way that you characterize it. I think what is singularly important about the strategy is the way that it reframes Africa's strategic importance to the United States and really makes the case that all of the global challenges that we face as an international community, whether it's the pandemic or it's climate change or just what is uh, the international world order, what should it be during this decisive decade, we believe that Africans will play a major role, not just African governments, but African publics, civil society, stakeholders in the diaspora. So that's really the starting point. It elevates Africa in our global conversation and in the conversation here in Washington about its role and its contributions. China is mentioned in it, but it's really trying to put a bigger and broader lens on what we're doing. And so as you noted, the strategy was announced in August in South Africa, uh, and then we had our summit in December, which was an effort to realize what this partnership with Africa could and should look like. Uh, and that was through you know, meetings and pledges and initiatives that we unveiled. And this 
week marks six months uh, since the summit. And I wanted to take some time, Eric, if you don't mind, just walking through what we've accomplished in these six months. We have a, a very exciting story to tell about how the commitments that the president made, uh, particularly his call to all of us that we are all in on Africa has really come to fruition. And, and there's probably five ways that I'd recommend thinking about progress. One, and you've noted this on the show many a times, is just the level, unprecedented senior travel to the continent. President Biden talked about eight senior level trips. He announced eight senior level trips at the summit, including his own. We here in June have already seen nine cabinet level trips to the continent. Secretary Yellen, our Secretary of the Treasury, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield to the UN, the First Lady, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, the Vice President, the Secretary of Education, Cardona, U.S. Administrator, Samantha Power, and the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Fudge. And there's more to come. And many of them are going to take second trips. In fact, the First Lady just went to North Africa, so she's already done two trips. And that's in addition to all of the next level down trips, deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries. I think our friend Yinka at Semaphore is counting this more closely than I am, and I think he's come up with more than 30. And what's important about these trips is not only is it a demonstration of our commitment to the continent, these are opportunities for us to advance policy to build stronger, more durable relationships with African governments and publics. And oftentimes, uh, we announce new deals and new deliverables on those trips. And here's the thing that I'm most excited about. When we have a number of these secretaries, cabinet-level officials who are more in the domestic space, when they come to the continent, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, I think they, they come back with a real sense of opportunity and it allows us to have conversations about more we can do across the U.S. government. So the trips are not only a signal to our African partners, but they're also a way that we can generate uh, more momentum within our U.S. government. So that's one, and I know that's been the most visible. The second point that's important to note is we announced that there would be a Presidential Advisory Council on African Diaspora Engagement. This got a lot of excitement here in the United States, a recognition that this is something very special about the U.S. relationship with Africa, that we have a vibrant diaspora, both uh, first and second generation African immigrants, but also African Americans. And so on June 9th, we notified Congress that we have established the Diaspora Council. In the next couple of weeks, uh, we will announce the members. And these 12 individuals will advise the president and the secretary of state on ways at which we can engage our diaspora, whether it's for trade and investment or addressing political challenges. So we're very excited about that. The third and one of the biggest announcements, and this is consistent with what you just said at the top, Eric, is around our investment in digital transformation. So this initiative, Digital Transformation with Africa, is an $800 million program. About half of that is programming, U.S. programming, and half of that is a commitment for financing. And we think this is a great opportunity for us to provide new skills, uh, help with digital literacy, get more people online, create new opportunities for U.S. investment, as well as work with our African partners on the enabling environment so that there is a steady flow of investment in this sector. And this is where the travel and the initiatives announced really meet. So Vice President Harris went to Lusaka, Zambia, and she had a call to action to get more companies and foundations, African and American, excited about the digital sector. This is essentially has created a philanthropic private sector arm to digital transformation with Africa. So you can see how trips layered on top of announcements, layered on top of implementation really moves us forward in a dramatic way. The fourth point is on our business deals. Uh, we announced $15.7 billion of investment at the summit. As these have closed, we've been able to, they've appreciated. And so now those particular investments are now up to $16.2 billion. And you already mentioned some of the exciting 
Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment uh, announcements, the Libido Port Corridor, the data centers in Ghana. So those are in addition to the $16.2 billion. So we're really uh, supersizing our trade and investment relationship with the continent. And then finally, I think it's just important to talk about the commitments we made on institutional reform. So President Biden reaffirmed his commitment that there should be an African seat uh, on the Security Council. He announced his commitment for the African Union to join the G20. We're also working on what are ways that we can diversify and amplify African voices in multilateral um, development banks. And then finally, we signed an MOU with the African uh, continental free trade area. And so all of those are continuing apace. So it's been a really busy six months since the summit. And as you note, a year since the strategy or almost a year. And we're very proud of what, of what we are doing. And we're excited to, con- to do more. So, you know, as you mentioned, and as Eric mentioned at the top, there's been this pivot in the approach and uh, the president and the secretary of state have all moved away from the idea of, of of Africa as a space in which to confront China and is much more towards focusing on the Africa-US relationship and particularly by also by demonstrating the benefits of the, of the partnership. But of course, this is happening in the context in Washington, particularly on Capitol Hill, where there is you know, increasing alarm about Chinese influence in the world and, and increasing kind of calls for for that influence to be confronted openly, you know, kind of in different different parts of the world. So I was wondering when you speak with African stakeholders about this, like what do you tell them about these two different messages that's coming out of the US at the same time? Kobus, as you rightly point out, Our strategy, our Africa strategy, is about our partnerships with Africans, with African governments, with African publics, and the role that Africans can play in in shaping um, the international community, both in terms of increasing peace and prosperity, but also working with us to really define the rules of the road on trade, technology, uh, and other sectors that matter to everyone who lives on this planet. But at the same time, you know, our relationship can't be defined by China, but it also can't be divorced from it. Um, and so the national security strategy does uh, call out the People's Republic of China as our most consequential geopolitical challenge. And so a true partnership with African countries means that we, we should talk about those things. And we do consult with African partners about uh, PRC engagement. We want to talk about what concerns us. We want to hear from them about how they see the relationship with China, what concerns them, what do they see as the benefits. I think that that's a responsible relationship. We are in a competition with China um, across a number of sectors. We understand that Africans have relationships with China, and a good partnership means we talk about um, our different perspectives and we work through them together. And so we don't shy away from the conversation, but we don't define the relationship solely on terms of geopolitical competition. It's interesting in those conversations that you have with African stakeholders and African leaders, I'm sure that one of the topics of discussion is of a key concern to them is the issue of large-scale infrastructure. Now, this was an area that China financed for a long time, things like the Standard Gauge Railway, big port projects, airports. You've tracked ports in your previous life of what the Chinese were building We all know that the Chinese have pulled back on that big infrastructure. Again, they're doing projects very similar to what you guys are doing as well in that smaller space. But this question of the large-scale infrastructure is interesting. And one of the talking points that comes out of the administration is that we can't match the Chinese dollar for dollar in terms of building infrastructure. That's been the long-time talking point. But if infrastructure is what African leaders say that they need now more than anything, especially with a bulging youth population that is eager for employment and, again, to mitigate against climate change, how do you show the benefits of this partnership you're talking about if you can't deliver what African governments want most, which is the small infrastructure projects are great, but the big stuff is what they need to close that trillion-dollar infrastructure deficit on the continent? You're exactly right that 
infrastructure is a huge priority for African countries. It's got some of the lowest uh, road and rail density in the world. There's a huge uh, gap, as you mentioned, Eric. And we agree with that, that this should be a focus. That's why the president has directed us through the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment to focus on this. And we have told our uh, economic agencies to really work with our private sector on investment uh, in infrastructure. So for example, we are already talked about some of the big announcements around the data centers and the Libido Port Corridor, but maybe you aren't aware that XM, our Export-Import Bank, has now earmarked $1.6 billion uh, for investment in Africa and African infrastructure that the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, after the summit, so in addition to what commitments they made at the summit, has now put another $95 million on the table for financing. And then at the summit, I just want to make sure I add is one of the biggest Millennium Challenge Corporation compacts that we announced was a road from Niger to Benin. So there's another example of infrastructure. So it is something that we are focusing on. But I may just try to complicate a little bit the question, Eric. One is that infrastructure is not just building roads and building bridges and ports. It's also about the engineering, it's about the operation, it's about the back of the house financing. And I've learned as much from you about the way American companies uh, play a role in this long tail of infrastructure. So I wanna make sure that we're clear that there's the building of this infrastructure and then there's the operation, the design, the financing, the maintenance, the sustainability, and American companies play a big role in that as well. And what's interesting is when I've talked to African countries specifically about infrastructure, of course they want to see big projects, but one of the things they turn to us is, is how can we have the capacity to make the best deals possible, to evaluate and to have that technical know-how uh, to operate uh, these infrastructure projects. So it's been an interesting, more nuanced conversation than sometimes you would hear on the press and the way in which Africans see our contributions to infrastructure. And then of course, while infrastructure is incredibly important. If you look at the work by our friends at Afrobarometer, what Africans say is the most important is addressing unemployment, is addressing good economic management and security. And I think we have very good stories to tell um, across those three priorities of Africans as uh, revealed by the Afrobarometer uh, surveys. So yes, infrastructure, but it's a yes and conversation. There's a number of other sectors that we have been world leaders on and we continue to invest in that are really valued by our African partners. And Kobus, that brings up a very interesting point because we've seen two light rail projects in Africa, the Addis Ababa light rail and also the Lagos Blue Blue Line that have run into problems after the Chinese have built those projects and handed them over to the host governments. They have fallen into disrepair and they've had difficulty keep maintaining their operations. So this idea of after sale service, and this is not the obligation of the Chinese here. They were contracted to build the project, not operated on an ongoing basis. So that point that Judd brings up in terms of how can the U.S. or other partners work with African governments to maximize the investment that African countries have made in Chinese financed infrastructure is also, I think, a very important aspect of all of this. Absolutely. And of course, human infrastructure is a key part of making sure that physical infrastructure has the kind of economic payoffs that, that they need. In relation to this, as you mentioned, uh, Vice President Harris recently um, put out this kind of call for greater interest and investment and focus on Zambia and in the tech sector. And historically, Chinese leaders have had certain kind of tools, you know, that, that at their disposal to facilitate Chinese companies moving into Africa. And um, so in the first place, obviously, just Chinese leaders just have more political leverage over Chinese companies. But then also, they have other tools, for example, the, the access to, to funding from policy banks, and particularly also de-risking tools in the form of state-controlled insurance firms like Sinosure that have significantly lowered the risk for Chinese, for Chinese private sector in, in moving into African projects. But obviously the US system isn't really set up that way. There isn't a, a kind of a state insurance company like Sinosure and there's also not the same level of political leverage, you know, in um, among by, by the US government among US companies. So I was wondering what kind of tools you feel the US government has to entice to persuade the U.S. private sector into kind of opportunities in Africa? 
Well, I think this is one of the strengths of our system is that our companies make investments when the deals are good, when they know there's going to be a return, that it's bankable, that they can uh, rely on a country's system for protections of their investment. So it's really a much more holistic look at investment opportunities, not just being told where to go. And so that means it comes down to three players, the United States government, U.S. companies, and African governments, if we're going to make this work. And so, you know, our role uh, as the U.S. government is to provide as much as we can to ease the opportunities for investments. So we do have ability to provide risk insurance and financing through XM or through the DFC. We have Prosper Africa, which is connected to our deal teams to surface opportunities and help companies navigate the U.S. government system. So that's one thing that we do. What American companies need is an opportunity. And we're working very closely with American companies to not only make the investment, but then to profitize, right? To preach the merits and the rewards of investing in Africa. So under the Obama administration, we set up another PAC, uh, the Presidential Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. And this group of U.S. executives uh, has been renewed several times. And they're really our ambassadors. Both they advise us, and we just had a, a large meeting here at the White House where they gave us our recommendations on what we could be doing better to assist U.S. investment. But they're also our ambassadors. And so one of the things that when I talk to the private sector and I talk to colleagues here in the interagency is when there is a big deal, we actually owe it to both our African partners, but the rest of the U.S. private sector to talk it up, to demystify it, to show that like there is real reward here and there's real opportunity. So I think that's work that we need to do and the U.S. private sector does. And the third partner here is African governments. They have to actually work on enabling environment. They got to get the legislation right. They got to make sure that courts are trustworthy and can mediate or adjudicate if there are disputes, uh, that the commercial law makes sense. So we all have to work together. And my view, guys, is that if you want to direct a company to invest in a certain sector or a certain country, and it's just done at the behest uh, of a leader, I don't know how durable that is. Uh, because uh, that was a one-way sort of direction. And what we're doing you know, with the U.S. private sector, with the influence and support of the U.S. government, and in partnership with our African governments and African businesses, is we hopefully create a much more sustainable investment with a lot of ownership and buy-in. Now, just to be fair, a lot of the Chinese private investment in Africa is not done at the behest of the government. A lot of it is driven by the same private sector considerations that the United States companies are evaluating as well. But I guess I'm just a little skeptical, Judd, because we haven't seen the trade numbers you know, tick up. We haven't seen the investment numbers really move. We've been hearing the same appeals from people in government to U.S. private business to invest in Africa, almost this desperate, you know, please get engaged, do something. And yet we see Facebook and we see Twitter closing their offices. And at the end of the day, when we look at the U.S. economy, we're a tech and finance led economy. What is it that we would actually do when you look at the Chinese where they are in manufacturing, they are in, they produce all, you know, pots, pans, all the things that we used to do, but we don't do. So I just wonder, you know, I hear what you're saying. It sounds really great, but are the results really there or is this still an aspirational goal to get American business engaged in Africa? Well, I think the results are there. You guys know that I'm, I'm kind of a geek for our, the history of, of U.S. diplomacy in Africa. And by the way, if you are a fan of U.S. history factoids, you should follow Judd on Twitter. He keeps posting every day. On this day in 1974, this African official met with this White House official. So it's a great little, if you're playing Trivial Pursuit Africa edition, this is the one you want to follow. So we'll give your Twitter handle at the end. But go on, Judd. Eric, you're blowing up my spot. People are now going to know that I do that. But, you know, when Vice President Nixon went to Africa in 1957 to uh, attend uh, Kwame Nkrumah's inauguration, he wrote a memo back to President Eisenhower, which talked about how do we stimulate a U.S. trade and investment in Africa. So it has been a decadal effort. And I think there's been a lot of work that has gone on, multiple programs over administrations, whether it's the African Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, Prosper Africa, some of the initiatives like 
President Biden's global partnership that we are working on to better understand our private sector and to bring uh, more investment to the continent. But as I said, you know, we've already increased the investment uh, from the summit uh, from 15.7 billion to 16.2 billion. There's been a number of really exciting deals that have just been closed. Motorola and the government of Senegal have just closed a deal for a secure nationwide digital network. The U.S. pharmaceutical giant Pfizer just closed a $15.5 million investment with South African company and on and on and on. And I think that we owe it to you, stakeholders, African partners, to keep telling these stories. I think the numbers will show improvement. I don't want to promise, but it feels like from where I sit, a lot more energy and excitement. And this is what we have to do is, one, tell the story, tell the story honestly about the challenges and opportunities. To leverage these trips and leverage uh, what I, again, would call our commercial ambassadors, those companies that are already persuaded and convinced that this is an opportunity, and then work with our African governments to keep opening the doors and doing the kind of reforms that are important. And both working on the sectors where we are very competitive on, technology, of course, is one of those green climate you know, investments, services, and then strive and endeavor to really widen the aperture on our investments on infrastructure what we, we, we've talked about on this uh, episode. So just segueing to, to politics, um, one of the hallmarks of the Biden administration has been a, a strong focus on democracy and human rights, and particularly a, quite a kind of a, an explicit kind of like delineation between, between um, democracies and autocracies. So I was wondering um, how effective you feel that particular approach has been in Africa, and particularly as, as a talking point relating to China. I know that like one of the critiques, and you guys have said it on the show a lot, is that the Chinese bring infrastructure and we bring lectures. Uh, so maybe I'll just challenge it a little bit. First of all, we know what Africans think about democracy and governance. Um, Afrobarometer you know, says that 69, 70% of Africans support democracy. If you read Agenda 2063, which is a sort of seminal document uh, from the African Union about the Africa that they want, and it was the basis for many of the sessions at the summit, democracy plays a big role. So I think that it's clear uh, that democracy is a system that is valued by, by many African publics and talked about by African leaders. And so I don't think there's a, a huge daylight between what President Biden says and what African people uh, aspire to. But, you know, one of the things that is important about the way that we're engaging on Africa is that uh, we can have conversations about democracy and human rights and trade and investment. We can also have conversations about uh, security and we can disagree. And one of the things that I, I'm really proud of is that our president and our leaders have these wide ranging conversations and, and we've sort of broken from the past of, uh, of more, I would say, one dimensional characterizations of certain governments or countries as bad or good. I mean, we bring the complexity uh, that we would bring uh, in a conversation with India to Africa. And I think that's been well received. And when we have disagreements, we say it publicly and we say it privately. And I actually think that's a great basis for a conversation. My hypothesis, guys, is that durable solutions start from disagreements. So rather than hide or run away from them, we go straight forward. We welcome the meetings and the conversations uh, when there are disagreements, whether that's about democracy or human rights, uh, or about sort of these big sort of questions about where the world goes. So I think that that is a really important tenet of the way in which we have approached the continent. And, and I do think that that's a distinction from previous administrations. Just to follow up, um, just uh, you know, remaining on, on the theme of human rights, you know, the last few years, we've seen quite intensive anti-LGBT campaigns happening in key US states, in Florida, in Texas, and, and so on. And we also saw recently saw strong indications that US, the conservative US stakeholders were also involved in the crafting and promoting of anti-LGBT legislation in Uganda. So I was wondering, you know, kind of in the context of the Biden administration's focus on human rights, you know, does this expose contradiction in that approach? And how do you and how does the White House kind of deal with those, the kind of complexity of, of the US kind of presence around these issues? Yeah, 
Kobus, it's a great question. And, you know, regardless of what the debate is in places in the United States, the president is extraordinarily clear about that LGBT rights are human rights. And uh, maybe we can talk just for a brief second about uh, the law that was passed in Uganda, the Anti-Homosexual Act, which is, is really a tragic violation of universal human rights. And as the president said, it's one that's not worthy of the Ugandan people. And it jeopardizes both the health of many people in Uganda who some services will not be provided for them. It, it also has really scared off private sector investment uh, in Uganda. And, and you may know that in the run-up to the, the signing of this, this awful bill, uh, many American companies said that they would have to reconsider their investments in Uganda. So, you know, I think that talking about these issues and standing up for our values is what uh, many African governments and people really respect about us. We say what we mean and, and we do what we say, and particularly on this issue when people are persecuted and threatened by some pretty awful, horrendous, inhumane punishments uh, for their sexual orientation, that we have to stand up and speak loudly about that and review our relationship to make sure that we are clear that this is unacceptable. I guess the hard part for me and for a lot of us on the outside looking in is that when we hear someone in your position say that, we go, okay, that makes sense. But at the same time, as Cobus mentioned, there are anti-LGBT passages, laws being passed now in more than a dozen states. And a lot of the values that you talk about are not being exercised at home. And whether this is on police brutality against African-Americans, and you talked about the importance of the African-American and the African diaspora, or whether it's on LGBT issues, I think a lot of people who are watching the United States from afar, hearing the rhetoric that you're saying, go, but wait, you guys at home haven't even reconciled with this, and you're lecturing to the Ugandans about what they do. I'm not supporting the Ugandans, please don't misunderstand me, but it does feel like there's a disconnect between the realities at home in the United States and the divisive politics that we see today here and the rhetoric that we see the United States project to other countries. How do you reconcile that? One of the things that I've really enjoyed before I was in government and when I returned to government is a conversation of the state of the world the challenges in the United States and the challenges in Africa and, and what we can learn from each other. As you know, Eric, as an American, this has been a difficult couple of years where there has been you know, challenges to our democracy and real questions about inclusion. And I've had really wonderful conversations, constructive conversations with African thought leaders about their views on the continent. And I think that my government should express our values and, and communicate concerns. And I think that it's perfectly appropriate and useful uh, for African governments and publics to share their concerns about what is happening in the United States. This shouldn't be a one-way street. You know, we shouldn't be standing as if we are morally superior. Uh, we're all working through these issues. I, I love the quote from our, our poet laureate uh, at President Biden's inauguration that we are unfinished. Uh, we keep striving uh, to be to better and to uh, to create uh, a society that is inclusive and treats everyone with respect. I think Africans agree with that proposition. And the conversations can be really productive when we talk about those things. And so uh, what can we learn from Africa? What are our challenges? What are their challenges? It's, a, it's, a, it's the right place to be uh, in terms of walking down uh, this road together to try to better our societies and the critiques. And maybe we'll talk about policy critiques as well. Like, I think that's important. We need the feedback. We need to hear the perspectives. Hopefully we can correct some of them. And if there are ones that are alarming, that we can also talk about what we're trying to do to address them here at home. Okay. Well, let's just quickly shift gears just before we go. It's not very often that we have someone in your position on the show, so I'd like to kind of take advantage of that. We mentioned that you're working in the National Security Council, and I think a lot of people have read about the NSC. They've heard about the NSC. 
but they don't actually know what it is. And so what I want to do is kind of, you know, take your podcast to work day now, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it's like behind the scenes at the NSC and what is you actually do and how policy is made. So let's kind of start there. I mean, you are the Senior Director for African Affairs. What does that mean? What do you do? Yeah, well, welcome to the National Security Council for this virtual tour. My job is really is twofold. So my job is to coordinate the interagency to make sure that we have a consensus on our, our policies, that we are implementing uh, programs as designed. And I'm sorry, when you say interagency, just let me just be really simple here. What agencies are we talking about here? Okay, so interagency is a, is a, is an abstract term, but we're talking about most of the foreign policy departments and agencies. So that starts with the State Department, uh, the Department of Defense, USAID, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development. That could include the intelligence community, our economic agencies such as Commerce, the U.S. Trade Representative, the DFC, XM Bank that we've been talking about. That's also uh, our mission to the United Nations. So it depends on the issue, but we bring together departments and agencies in the United States government that have a, a stake or an equity in a particular issue. And so it's my job to make sure we're all rowing in the, in the same direction. And related to that is the second imperative, which is making sure that we're advancing the president's priorities. And so the president has a strategy. He's you know talked about his views on Africa. Um, and so my job is to make sure that uh, we are doing what the president has directed us to do. Uh, and so that can be in a variety of different things. Uh, that can be chairing meetings, that can be engaging with foreign partners, uh, that could be uh, listening uh, to uh, thought leaders, civil society, uh, but it's in service of those two efforts, advancing the president's priorities and coordinating the national security community. So in, you know, implementing a pivot, as, as, as we discussed earlier, you know, kind of from one kind of, of approach to Africa to a different kind of U.S. foreign policy approach to Africa, who are the key kind of stakeholders involved in actually, once there's that kind of like shift has been decided in actually crafting the policies that will, that will actually make that happen? Like, like, you know, beyond, beyond you and your team, like who else is also involved in that process? Sure. Well, we provide strategic direction with the strategy, although that strategy was coordinated and debated and road tested multiple times. But one of my biggest partners is a former guest of yours, Assistant Secretary Molly Fee, who runs the Africa Bureau at the State Department. And so she oversees all of our embassies on the continent. And so, you know, they're working within their own interagencies because at an embassy, it's not just the diplomats. There's, you know, members of the Department of Defense and sometimes Foreign Commercial Service representatives. So they're, they're doing the work on the ground. And, you know, there are assistant secretary level equivalents, my counterparts in all of the major departments and agencies uh, that will then develop their own guidance based on the strategy uh, towards implementation. So that's how it sort of flows down, uh, a consensus uh, approved by the president on what our approach should be, and then departments and agencies are going to work to implement it on, on the ground, either here in Washington, but more likely than not, on the continent or in New York or in Addis Ababa where the AU is or in Geneva and some of the other sort of international capitals where there are, you know, uh, UN or multilateral bodies. One of the things that I've been most curious about is that Washington is a, a very unusual culture and especially working in government is unusual as well, in part because you're flooded with information. I mean, you have data coming in from all sides. You've got intelligence, you've got the cables coming from the State Department, you've got reports coming from, from all directions. Obviously, you've got a news media, the think tanks that you're familiar with. But a lot of it, though, is of a similar genre. And, and Washington's a place where you can sing from your own music, right, your own song sheet. And I'm wondering, how do you get information that is dissenting, that challenges the worldviews, that is a little bit different than what you would get, say, from the traditional intelligence sources and other you know, mainstream establishment sources in Washington, so that you aren't just operating within a feedback loop. Yeah, it's, it's really important to make sure that you break out of the echo chamber. And I spend a lot of my time trying to do just that. Um, I'm up early every morning 
reading 30 different African newspapers. So what is the Star or East African or Premium Times or the Sowetan? What are they saying about what's happening in their country? And what are their views on U.S. relations or African relations with, with China? Think tanks and, and civil society groups and watchdogs, you know, they either send their reports to me um, directly or, or I reach out for it because I want to hear it. And I, it's okay if we, we disagree, but I think I would be doing a disservice to the American people and our partnership with Africans if we didn't, I didn't listen to it and solicit it. And I, I really want the feedback. And I, I listen to, of course, your show, uh, but lots of other podcasts and talk to academics. Uh, I, we need to have a really wide-ranging conversation with people who agree and disagree if we're going to get to the best solutions. So President Biden has another year and a half left in office. What can we expect from U.S. engagement in Africa for the remainder of the current term? Sure. Well, one of the things is a, a trip by President Biden to the continent. I don't have any big announcements here, but we're very excited that he will uh, visit by the end of this year. And then there's a couple things maybe that I'll, I'll just say that I think are useful for people to kind of keep their eyes uh, open over the next six months. One is that how do we, and we're committed to doing this, treat Africa not siloed, not as a, a continent apart from the rest of the world, but how do we integrate African issues into these global conversations? And so, you know, we are looking at what are the big global initiatives that we can have that will have a, a big role uh, and benefit to the continent. Um, you know, one of the examples that I'll just uh, lay out is that the New World Bank president, uh, Ajay Banga, you know, came with a, a mission uh, to the World Bank to really look at concessional loaning to make sure that there's you know money available uh, for African and other low-income countries, uh, and also how does he integrate transnational issues like climate change and health. So that's an example of where that's happening. We're also uh, continuing our conversations that I mentioned at the top about integrating Africa into the world's institutions. Those are a, a couple of things that that I think people should look forward to. In addition to the summit implementation, six months in, I think we have a great story to tell and, and thank you guys for the opportunity to share it, but we're not done. More deals, more travel, making more progress on our implementation, making sure the money is flowing and that we have the feedback loop uh, to get the response from our African partners, and this is where Ambassador Johnny Carson has been an incredible ally because he's out there traveling to the continent, listening to people, talking to diplomats here in Washington. And so we're continuing to iterate on how do we do this in a way that benefits both the American and the African people. And I think so for the next six months and beyond, I think those are some of the hallmarks you will see in our approach. Okay, well, we're looking forward to checking in with you towards the end of the term, just to kind of look back and see how it how everything went. Uh, Judd Devermont is the Senior Director for African Affairs at the National Security Council in the White House. Judd, as I've mentioned, you are prolific on Twitter. Where can people find you if they want to follow all your historical factoids on Twitter? Well, let me just make sure that this is clear. This is my personal account. So if you want uh, official government news, go to the uh, official NSC or State Department handles. But at Jay Devermont is where I geek out on U.S. diplomatic history and whatever Afrobeats music that I'm listening to. Fair enough. And so we'll put a link to the Twitter handle and also we'll put a link to some of the announcements that we talked about at the top of the show about all those new infrastructure projects that are underway. Judd, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us today. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. I think longtime listeners of the show will know that I have been probably more critical than positive of U.S. foreign policy in Africa for the years. But I do want to compliment Judd and, and the discussion we had today, because I think this is a kind of discussion that it would be hard to have with a lot of governments and someone in his position who was actually making the policy. And he was humble on the shortcomings of the United States today. And I don't think you hear that very often coming from senior stakeholders. That's refreshing to hear because I think that's what a lot of people feel is the cognitive dissonance. There, there's a sense of arrogance that comes out of the United States when they're talking about democracy, and yet the United States is retreating in democracy. When it talks about LGBT issues, and the United States is passing laws at the state level that are restricting rights. And obviously, when it comes to the treatment of minorities, particularly African-Americans, 
of the history is long, painful, and miserable. And so to hear Judd at least acknowledge that, I think is very powerful. And it's something that I wish the United States would do more often. And, and I, I was pleasantly surprised by that. So, you know, that, that for me was, uh, was a key takeaway. Yeah, me too. Like, I think I think it's very valuable to discuss the difficulties, you know, in 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 these processes. And I think I think that's that's very encouraging. And I think it's also, you know, very valuable to then also see, you know, what it means to put a commitment to human rights and democracy out into the world, knowing that frequently it gets a hostile reaction. Because on the one hand, sometimes, as as you say, sometimes the U.S. doesn't necessarily always kind of like walk the talk, you know, kind of in, in, in relation to these issues, but it frequently does. And then frequently gets a lot of flack for that. So, you know, so so knowing that that one is moving into the, a complicated position that will complicate relations, particularly in the global south, but still doing it, I think, be, is, is, is a very valuable thing. It's also interesting that the United States does not have a uniform approach to how it talks about China in the global south. So the strategy that Judd is leading at the NSC in creating policy for the U.S. and Africa that really downplays the role of China is very different than what we see in Latin America and out here in Southeast Asia, where China is foremost. And you hear this in a lot of the stakeholders at the senior level in the U.S., peers of Judd's, who talk about China in a much more aggressive way and still have China at the forefront of their engagement. And I think in many ways, the Africa policy is far more progressive uh, on that front. Now, some may argue that the reason why they can downplay China and Africa is because Africa just isn't that important to the United States relative to Latin America or Asia. But I think it's important to draw a distinction in how the different regions talk about China differently, and there is not a uniform approach. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's. It, I think it's, it's very easy to, you know, if if one is very concerned about the rise of China, it's very easy to use the work that we do and work that, that, that many of the people that we interview, you know, in tracking this work in order to then say, well, look, China's a problem everywhere. You know, being more nuanced and, and, and knowing that the presence of China is different in different places and that there's different kind of issues around around that presence in each locality is very valuable, I think. I assume it's also very challenging, in, you know, in, 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 on, on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly when there is such a strong kind of drumbeat, like anti-China drumbeat in, you know, on Capitol Hill, as we're seeing at the moment. You know, one of the criticisms that has been out there for a very long time is that China was able to maximize its position in Africa in the early 2000s because the U.S. and Europe had taken their eye off the ball. And the U.S. and Europe disengaged for the most part. And so while as the U.S. and Europe weren't there, the Chinese moved in. And the Chinese, for a long time, had you know more high-level visits than anybody else. And they got a lot of attention for this. What's interesting is when you look at 2023 in particular, Qing Gang, the foreign minister, has not been back to the continent since his January trip. That is very different it to is, Wang Yi. I saw an announcement that he might be coming, though. So I'm not. I, I haven't seen a confirmation, but yeah. he might be coming. But he didn't come for the BRICS a foreign ministers meeting in Cape Town, and that was very notable. But normally, by this time, his predecessor Wang Yi had made two or three trips. He was very consistent in coming for lots of different reasons to Africa, and we haven't seen the the same level of high level visits from the Chinese this year, certainly not comparable to what the United States are doing. And so I think it's interesting that we're seeing a pullback in some respects from the Chinese in terms of the large-scale development finance. We're seeing a pullback in the high-level visits. And at the same time, the United States is stepping up on infrastructure financing, nowhere near what the Chinese were doing, but certainly more than what they've done in the past. And then all of the high-level visits that Judd talked about, including a Biden visit that will come sometime within 2023, as they promised at the U.S. Africa Leader Summit last year. I don't think she is scheduled to come to Africa. There's been no talk of it this year that he's going to come. So that would be a very interesting comparison to look at as the, the shift. And is China now refocusing its diplomacy on Southeast Asia, the South China Sea, the United States, and the Middle East, and downplaying Africa, as the United States did and Europe did in the early 2000s?
I mean, one could probably make the argument that that there's a parallel movement happening in, in the US and China around these issues in the sense that they're both focusing on relatively... In in, the, in 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 broad terms, on in, in their, their their specific environment, right? Kind of so. So as you say, China is focusing a lot on the South China Sea and 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 on on Central Asia, and then, but of course, you know, the, the Africa is part of the Atlantic world, you know. So so it is part of 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 that kind of sphere of of of, of U.S. influence. I expect that that this might be a, a somewhat quiet year for Chinese engagement because they are so kind of focusing on on the immediate neighborhood but then of course next year will probably be much much intensified you know um in 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 the run-up to to the coming focac um, summit now one other point that i want to make is while we have not seen a lot of activity by the central government we have seen a really sharp increase by provincial governments specifically hunan province and we've been tracking this in our daily coverage of all of the provincial visits that have been happening to Africa. And I think that is something very, very important to look at, is that the diversity of, you know, I didn't want to call them non-state actors, but sub-national actors, I think is the IR poli-sci term for it, which is everybody below the central government. So municipals, municipalities from Shanghai and from Chongqing, provinces from Shandong province and Hebei and also Hunan and Guangdong I've seen as well. They're making tours. So a lot more variety in the stakeholders from the Chinese side. And maybe that's going under the radar and not capturing the tension. But at the same time, it's still happening. So I want to keep everybody's attention on that. Also coming up in June is the big, or July, I think it is, the big Hunan China Africa Trade Expo. And that is a big deal. And one of the things that I think you heard in Judd's comments, and I tried to check him a little bit on it, is this idea that the Chinese direct their investment. And that is this old idea of that it's state controlled and that it's the big SOEs when there's a lot of activity from small private enterprises and small to medium sized enterprises, in fact. And a lot of that's going to happen at this China Africa Trade Expo that takes place in Hunan, in Changsha, which is the capital of Hunan. So something else to keep an eye on there. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that beyond it simply being agreements, MOUs, deals, and, you know, kind of other forms of commercial engagement, there's a lot of trade architecture being set up in Hunan. You know, kind of infrastructural kind of trade routes, transport links, logistics centers, you know, like clearance houses and, and so on. So so they seem to be really kind of settling in for a long haul relationship beyond particular deals. You know, so so in that sense, it's it, it, it seems to be a kind of a part of a bigger move in China to strengthen food security, trade security, energy security, you know, beyond traditional shipping routes. And that in, involves Africa, but it also involves Southeast Asia, Central Asia, you know, and South Asia a lot. Um, so all of that is, is very interesting. It's, 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 it's a structural move rather than rather than just kind of business engagement. And also keep an eye on agricultural deals. And this is one of the areas where I don't think we're going to see a lot in the U.S. because the U.S. agricultural industry is highly protectionist. Try importing a banana into the United States or sugar into the United States, and it gets very difficult if you're not part of a, you know, the, Af- the agricultural industrial complex in the U.S. The Chinese are moving very aggressively, not just with Africa, but in just the, the new deals that they did with Honduras was coffee and bananas in Southeast Asia. They've got the green lanes like they do with Africa, which is the fast tracking of agricultural imports into uh, China. And so I think a lot of agricultural deals will take place at the Hunan Fair. Also, in Hunan, there was a great little factoid that came out that year-on-year increase in trade was up more than 90%. 90%. So that's something very interesting. I think it speaks to some of those logistical corridors that you've been talking about, that it's just getting easier now to trade between Africa and Hunan. So we'll see a lot more on that. So great. That was a lot of fun to have a chance to speak with Judd. We've spoken with him over the years. If you go through the archives, you'll see back when he was at CSIS, we spoke with him. And now, of course, when he's at the NSC, he's always a lot of fun to speak with. And we're really grateful that, again, he took time out of his schedule to join us. Uh, Judd reads our stuff every day at the NSC. His colleagues do. We hope you will join Judd and become a reader and subscriber of the China Global South Project. Subscriptions are very affordable. They start just at $19 a month. 
They support the independent journalism that Cobus and the team are doing. We've got editors in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East putting together just a fantastic daily brief. We've also launched a pilot program of a new chat service, and uh, that's something that's really neat. It's a chat GPT engine that you can try out. It's a little rough around the edges, I'll admit. It does send back some strange questions and some strange answers, but it's also, I think, very helpful for people who want to do some basic research on China, Africa, and China Global South. And it's a closed network. So it's only information from the China Global South project and the transcripts from our podcast and experts like Judd, who all together, they bring that information. We thought that would be useful because when you go out onto the regular chat GPT, there are a lot of what they call hallucinations, which are the kind of mistakes that come up. There's not any sourcing material behind it. And also, it tends to have certain biases built in based on the information sources that it's drawing from. So we thought, let's try and build our own. So go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash chat, and you will be able to play with it. Again, I don't pretend that it's perfect, but we want it to get it out, and we want you to play with it and let us know what you think and if it helps you. So go check that out. But all of that comes with your subscription to the China, China Global South Project, so we hope that you will go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Give it a try free for 30 days and let us know what you think. So Cobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, for Cobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at chinaglobalsouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.